So now we are going to uh, start with question seven. What was the reagent for the following reaction? And so here you have alkyl iodide, secondary alkyl iodide, which means that reaction mechanism could be either SN1 or SN2. And then we have this um, product, uh, isocyanate. Um, so uh, first of all, you will notice that uh, starting material is single enantiomer, and product is enantiomer with inverted configuration. That means reaction mechanism is SN2. So uh, nucleophile was rather strong nucleophile, probably something that is negatively charged. And so what was the nucleophile? Well, you can draw a conclusion just by looking at the equation that NCO has to be nucleophile. That's, that's actually isocyanate group. And actually, since it's strong nucleophile, NCO minus. So isocyanate anion. And of course, anions don't exist on their own. You can't just buy a bottle of anion. Uh, it comes accompanied by cation, some ionic compound. So probably some metal ion will accompany that. Typical ions, that metal ions that accompany such, that accompany uh, in ions would be alkali or alkaline earth metals. Typically something like uh, lithium, sodium, potassium, magnesium, calcium, something like that. And so you would be looking for NCO accompanied by one of those cations. First one is NCO with metal group. So, no, that's not correct. That's actually already product of another reaction where, uh, let's say, iodine was bonded to metal group. So that's not correct. So here we have NCO bonded to chlorine. No, because uh, chlorine is not cation. This would be covalent bond. Reagent like this could be used, but it has completely different properties. It won't react in this reaction. NaNCO, that's sodium cation that accompanies isocyanate and iron. That's correct. And last one would be corresponding acid H. That's not strong nucleophile enough. So that's not correct. So C is correct answer. And that's in general how you approach questions like this. Uh, you identify what is the... Uh, you identify uh, what was the suspected nucleophile. Uh, yeah, there it is. Identify what is the su suspected nucleophile. And then if it's SN2 mechanism, that would be anion. And then uh, you look for reagent where that anion is accompanied by suitable cation. In this case, it would be C. There's a little bit more discussion about this specific anion. That's actually not relevant. It's only if you're interested, you can read a little bit about organic isocyanate and cyanate ion and so on. Uh, but uh, nothing to worry about. It's really to answer this question, you just follow the procedure I told you about identify what was the reagent, what was the anion, and then that would probably be something negatively charged. That means it has to be accompanied by positively charged metal cation, and then you look where is the reagent like that. Which of these is reagent like that? Question number eight, somewhat similar. Uh, what is the product of the following reaction? So actually here we are looking at the product. So you can see um, question, each reaction has three components, uh, substrate, in this case alkyl halide, reagent, like a nucleophile, and product. And so typically you are given two to figure out third. So here you were, gi you were given starting material, substrate, and product to figure out reagent. You could be given starting material and reagent to figure out product, or reagent and product, what was the starting material. So what is the reaction? Well. If you consider first Fischer projection, uh, that's obviously single enantiomer. And then uh, you have reaction, a reagent is sodium iodide in acetone. That's so-called so Finkelstein reagent and Finkelstein reaction. Uh, this reagent reacts with substrates like alkyl chlorides and alkyl bromides to give alkyl iodides. It replaces chlorine or bromine with iodine. Reaction mechanism is always SN2, which means that it works on primary and secondary substrates. As I said, always SN2 reaction mechanism. Of course, this is strong nucleophile. And since it's SN2, proceeds with inversion of configuration. Um, 
if we are using Fisher projections, inversion means that if leaving group was on the right, then in the product, incoming nucleophile will be on the left. And we, here in this compound, we actually have two chirality centers. On carbon two, we have uh, we have actually carbon two chirality center that actually has leaving group, and carbon three that has methoxy group. Methoxy group actually in this case is unaffected. So uh, in the product, chirality center three should be unaffected, and so A has chirality center three unaffected. So A, so that's what you look first. So A is possible answer. B also. C no. Uh, chirality center is inverted. No, that's not going to happen. And D unaffected. So you can eliminate C. And then what you're looking for is inversion of configuration, where iodine displaces bromine in backset attack. So it's going to be on the left and flips hydrogen to the right. Uh, here, this is obviously not possible product where both leaving group and uh, nucleophile are retained and hydrogen somehow lost. That's, that's wrong. B looks correct because that's inversion of configuration. And D is actually retention of configuration, which is not correct. That's not how acid 2 reactions work. So correct answer is B. Yeah, let me see if there are any questions. Uh, for number seven, why is H plus in D not a suitable cation? Uh, that's actually just a weak acid. So H and CO or isocyanic acid or cyanic acid, whatever it's called, uh, is not uh, not a strong, uh, well, uh, it's not strong acid, so it's not highly ionized. Also, uh, in general, we use, uh, we don't use acids. Like if, it, if it's a weak acid, then it's not ionized, so uh, it's a weak nucleophile. If it's strong acid, then uh, that could interfere with reaction. H plus could interfere with reaction because, um, uh, depending on what what, what reaction is, uh, it could protonate various species. So in general, we don't use uh, strong acids. So for example, uh, if you need iodide ion as uh, um, nucleophile, we are going to use sodium iodide or potassium iodide, not hydroiodic acid simply because strong acid could cause could protonate species and cause numerous side reactions. But in this case, it just won't work. Uh, question number nine. So it was about question seven, like why the H and CO is not suitable. Simply, it doesn't, it's not really source of anion, of isocyanate anion. But the as a weak acid, it's ionized to a very low extent. Question number nine. What is the product of the following reaction sequence? So here we have terminal alkyne, and when we count carbons, one, two, and there are two carbons here. That's four, five. So that's one pentyne. So this is one pentyne. And then uh, what is the product? Okay, let me see actually. So uh, in this case, uh, it's best to write down the sequence and figure out the product of each step and then what is the final product. So, first step is actually deprotonation with strong base. Deprotonation of terminal alkyne. We covered it in chapter 5 and also, uh, I believe, in chapter 10. So, and now we are just looking at the mechanism. So, deprotonation of terminal alkyne gives acetylate anion. And now you know the mechanism. We covered this in chapter 10 at the beginning. So uh, it's SN2 substitution. And so this is the product. And so um, this is cyclopentyl group. And so this is cyclopentyl 1 pentyne. Remember how we name alkynes. Longest chain that contains triple bond. That is open chain. Open chain. Five carbons. So that's one pentyne. And on carbon 1, we have another chain, in this case a ring. So cyclopentyl 1 pentyne. So with questions like these, always write down the sequence. What is the product of the first step, product of the second step, and then if necessary, name it. Or maybe you will have um, uh, you will have 
four formulas to pick out correct answer. In that case, if you have four formulas, then you should actually try to um, uh, do question on your own without looking at the four choices and then match your answer with one of four choices. Uh, question number 10, which reagent reacts with bromocyclopentane to give cyclopentyl propyl ether? And here we have four reagents. It's best to write the reaction. So bromocyclopentane, and this is cyclopentyl propyl ether. So now what is the reagent? You have already seen this. This is the living group, and it's replaced by this species, right? And so three carbons and oxygen, that's propoxide anion. And that anion has to be accompanied by some uh, cation. And that cation is going to be lithium, sodium, potassium, something like that. Maybe less commonly something like magnesium, something like that. And so first one is actually potassium propoxide. That's the one. So that's the correct one. That's the correct answer. One fluoropropane. It's with propyl that actually uh, alkyl bromides don't react with alkyl fluorides to alkyl halides. Dipropyl ether. That we simply ether with two propyl groups. Ethers are unreactive. And or propyl methyl ether. But also propanol. One propanol would not work. Because um, for one propanol, well, one propanol uh, would be vastly inferior reagent because this would be SN1 reaction mechanism and that would be SN1 on secondary substrate. We would need to heat it and there would be numerous side reactions. In general, bimolecular reactions uh, provide better yields and um, cleaner products, that means fewer side products compared to unimolecular reactions. And whenever possible, we carry out bimolecular reactions. And that's if unimolecular reactions work. Frequently, unimolecular reactions don't work at all. In this case, unimolecular reaction with propanol would have worked, but would have given very low yield of impure product, as opposed to potassium propoxide that would give excellent yield of the product. That's why I didn't put propanol, one propanol as a choice. I simply didn't want to confuse you. And that's actually Williamson ether synthesis. Uh, you will be doing Williamson ether synthesis in the lab. I don't know which one, but you should be doing one in the lab. Okay, let me see if there are any questions before we cover the final one. No? Okay. Uh, 11. Which of the following compounds does not undergo a substitution reaction? So, does not undergo, that means which does not undergo SN1 or SN2? Neither. So, if it can undergo one or the other, then it undergoes substitution reaction. And so, of course, again, you should write down all the formulas. So, A, 1-bromo-2-butane. That's actually allylic bromide. This one readily undergoes both SN1 and SN2. So, A is definitely not the, the answer. This one undergoes everything. Reacts really readily. B, 2-chloro-2-methyl-butane. This one is tertiary chl chloride. Uh, that one undergoes readily SN1 reactions which means it undergoes substitution reactions. C, bromocyclobutane, that's cyclic bromide, secondary, it will undergo both SN1 and SN2. So again, no problem. May, uh, maybe because of the ring, not as fast, but nonetheless. But D, 2-iodo-1-butane, uh, yeah, that's correct. That one is vinylic iodine. Vinylic compounds, remember vinylic and arylic compounds, where substituent is directly on benzene ring, that's arylic. So vinylic and arylic compounds do not undergo uh, SN1 or SN2 reactions. They don't undergo SN2 because backside attack is not possible because of the steric hindrance. So there is hydrogen here, and so it back is simply uh, nucleophile cannot come from the back. And SN1 because this cation is vanillic cation and it cannot form, it's too unstable. So vanillic compounds don't undergo SN1 and SN2. And that's why you need to draw these formulas to figure out which would be the correct answer. Don't try just to pick one out of all these from the name. Okay, and so uh, this completes uh, exercises uh, related to chapter 12.